In 2002, uh, Max and I met Jason. And we realised that uh, he was probably going to be part of our extended family of people that are not related to each other within the uh, the lodge, which is our home and is now the headquarters of the Enid. Because in 2002, there was no Enid, really. Um, we did one show in 2002 uh, at the Astoria with Jason, and he then went off to university and uh, did a music course. By 2007, when he was back, Max and I and Jason decided that really we could make a go of the band again. And that would have been uh, me finding a new musical language so that I could uh, integrate the creative abilities, which are very different to mine, of Max. So this was a synthesis between me as a largely orchestral uh, composer and Max who wrote pop songs, Space Surfing, Shiva, Mars, Malacandra. These are all things that actually uh, arose from my collaboration with Max. A difficulty, a practical one of money, was uh, th a big obstacle to how a band with very little money, living hand to mouth from the earnings of our recording studio, uh, with rent arrears and those things, could actually equip ourselves and get ourselves ready to do live music again. Because there was no point, particularly with a band like the Enid, in just making records, particularly when our old fan base had lar largely given up on us that the Enid were a busted flush by the end of the 90s, and that was quite true. Um, you know, they were a terrible time for me. Uh, I'm not someone who likes to serve myself up as a victim, and I don't for one moment want people to think that that's what I'm saying. It was a terrible time. Many of my contemporaries have gone through long periods of depression and creative people where they have block and where they simply lose any kind of self-belief mm -hmm in their ability to produce anything that's worthwhile. So that's the kind of situation that I was in. The money problem that presented itself in 2007, 2008, uh, was solved in a way which I am deeply ashamed of because of the problems that it has led to. I did... Um, a record deal with someone who I thought had been a friend and supporter encouraging me to try and get off my ass and do more and his name was Gerald Palmer. I asked him and approached him for some money based on the fact that he was the licensee of the Enid Back catalogue. A licensee means not someone who owns it but someone who for a uh, percentage, rather like an agent, uh, takes on the job of exploiting it, takes his cut, and then pays the owner, uh, which in this case was actually not me. In order to get the £10,000 that we desperately needed to equip the band and to, uh, to be able to get into first gear, I did this deal with Gerald. And I warranted that I was the owner of the In His Back catalogue when I wasn't. The dreadful thing is, is that he knew this as well. But he, he was absolutely adamant that the only way he was going to prov provide the cash we needed uh, was if I signed this contract with him. So I did it. In the 1980s, Steve Stewart and I, who were the joint owners and inheritors, if you like, of the Enid's back catalogue to then, 
uh, found ourselves in a not dissimilar situation to the one I've described. It was slightly different. In the, the 80s, we had plenty of income coming in, but not enough to expand the band. So we turned to the uh, individual members of the stand uh, for uh, help in producing and promoting our recordings. And what we did in return for them being prepared to undertake to do it all, we assigned the rights, he and I together, to the stand. And Richard Booley, um, who is still a very close friend of the band, uh, he was the person uh, who undertook to be the custodian of those copyrights. Having done the deal with Gerald Palmer, I then found myself having to admit to the stand what I had done, and they asked me what I was going to do about it. So I, um, I went to see a solicitor, and I explained exactly what had happened and how I got led into this uh, situation with uh, Gerald Palmer. And he um, suggested that really I had been, uh, I'd had a lot of pressure, it's called undue influence, because he was in a position of power over me and indeed the future of the band and able to dictate terms. He drew up the contract, he said what he wanted in it. In the meantime, our manager, uh, a great chap called Billy, who had come in to help the band uh, rebuild our career. He um, very politely and very reasonably uh, asked for a meeting with Gerald to try and renegotiate or to clarify, I think was probably more what it was to do with, the terms of the agreement I'd signed with him. Uh, Palmer's reaction to Billy was extremely hostile. And it was at that point that I began to see Gerald Palmer not as a reasonable, uh, successful businessman, but a sociopath who saw himself at the centre of his possessions. And his possessions weren't just material things, they were the members of his family, his employees, bands that he had uh, signed and done things to before, and me. And um, one, when he, uh, when he uh, found out that we had appointed a manager, he insisted that I should make a public statement from the stage at the Bush Hall, which was a show which he had helped us put on, uh, to dedicate that show to Gerald Palmer, to his two sons, Adam and Sam, and his family. And I was told that there was, there was to be no argument about it, and I did it. I then began to feel that things were... I became uneasy. Unbeknown to me at this time, while Gerald was pretending to have um, discussions with Billy, our manager, he went behind our back and secretly registered our trademark, or attempted to it, not even in the name of one of his uh, music business companies, but in his own personal right. And of course, uh, this would have all taken place behind the scenes. We would not have known about it. How we found out is very interesting, because it turned out that one of his sons, who'd been at the Bush Hall, where I'd had to make this uh, statement, um, he had been overheard by one of the fans saying, my dad owns the band. And when I found out about this, when I heard about this, I thought, what? And I, I had a kind of moment of paranoia. And I looked on the intellectual property website, and lo and behold, there was an application with two days to go before it became a matter of fact that uh, Gerald Palmer had applied for the Enid 
as a trademark, which he was not entitled to do. That created a tremendous amount of uh, legal activity. In the end, uh, this came to court about three years later, after much prevarication and tens of thousands of pounds in legal fees having to be found. Palmer was found to have acted dishonestly and in bad faith, and the application that he had made was dismissed and the uh, trademark was rightfully declared as belonging to the band. Now, in spite of the fact that um, he had done all that, uh, we were still faced with all these costs. The legal system is geared in such a way that um, it's very difficult to get many of the costs that you incur, even when you win. And that is something that um, I don't think we really realised. Anyway, this created um, a, a real war with this man who was a, a, a fan from hell. And uh, it had the, the ironic effect, if you like, that me, who had been somebody who had largely given up on my creative life, became, uh, if you like, um, ignited by um, this Hitler-type person. Uh, and I felt uh, a little bit like Churchill in 1940, you know, having to um, battle a very wealthy man who was absolutely determined uh, to bring the Enid into line and to get rid of our manager. He went on to claim rights in a recording that we'd done uh, with the uh, uh, CBSO, um, the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, a big project that we put together. Um, Palmer interfered wrongfully with EMI's plans to release that. They pulled out of the deal and we were left unable to pay um, the orchestra uh, for the recording, um, which we were going to pay out of the advance from EMI. So he managed to scupper that. He then went on to claim ownership of Journey's End, which was our first of the trilogy, and released it. Uh, and we had to take legal action to, to get that uh, brought to an end, so that was achieved. Uh, he then uh, laid claim to the Enid's publishing, uh, which he was not entitled to do. And that uh, matter um, became a real, a real problem. I, in the end, was bankrupted personally by the firm of solicitors that were representing me against Palmer because I simply couldn't pay their their fees. Um, they were very, very unreasonable, actually. You know, uh, solicitors are, I'm afraid these days, they're not like the family doctor or the consultant surgeon. Um, they are much more like um, uh, payday lenders, uh, estate agents, you know, it's all about um, their fee. They don't care uh, particularly about um, what they do. And I think that I really do have a beef with that. Anyway, I suppose that to put it in a nutshell, um, in my attempts to rectify what I had done um, in, with respect to signing that contract, um, I went personally bankrupt. That bankruptcy is over and Palmer achieved nothing from that bankruptcy because the band, by virtue of the fact that I had actually assigned all my personal intellectual property to the band in any event um, in 2009 after that, meant that um, the band were able uh, to tackle the issue of the publishing. And that conflict, which has gone on for years, uh, is now, as far as we're concerned, at an end. I've done my very best to uh, to put right what I put wrong, and I think I've been, in some sense, partially successful. The case that uh, uh, against Gerald Palmer 
uh, and the back catalogue, it remains now in an unsettled position. Because the property wasn't mine to, uh, to sell him, I, um, it didn't pass under law. He cannot have had it. And even if he challenges the, uh, the assignments that were made by me and Steve Stewart back in the 1980s, and was successful in saying, well, these assignments, you know, they weren't real or they were this. That would leave it still in the position where I and Steve Stewart jointly owned these things. And you can't sell something to somebody when it's the joint property between you and someone else without their consent. So we're now left in a situation where almost certainly the Anidi, the successors to the stand, own the band's back catalogue. And we've got the publishing back, we've got the trademark back, we put an end to his bootlegging of Journey's End, and the issue with the CBSO has been settled for all practical reasons, for all practical purposes. So the achievements um, have been uh, very costly, but on the whole very positive. The, the, the battle has galvanised me because I realise that the actual uh, survivor of the band was at stake to write a lot of music I would have never have written, to get out of my arse and to battle this situation out. And it's had the perverse effect that this um, monstrous man, uh, who is determined still and will always try his best, I think, now, having been the loser of this. I mean, he's been branded as dishonest and unreasonable in several court hearings. Uh, his reputation uh, has been totally lost. Uh, when this story is told, which it will be in the most amusing terms, actually, um, uh, he, he will not have achieved anything but a Pyrrhic victory out of this. I apologise for what I did. Some may say, well, I had no choice, and they would be very generous in that. The point is, Gerald Palmer and I did something that we knew was dishonest so that he could give me some money to get the band going again. And um, I shouldn't have done it. And I did do it, and I'm very, very sorry that I did. You know, I've got a lot to be grateful, actually, to Gerald Palmer for, in the sense that uh, he has revived me uh, intellectually, in spite of my diment, diment, <laughs> dementia. See, it suddenly hit me. Um, dementia uh, uh, diagnosis. I don't actually feel um, unable to cope still. And my health isn't great, but... Uh, you know, I do spend quite a bit of time at the doctors and various things having myself looked after. So I do have the possibility of quite a few more years going on as a creaking door. Um, my role with the band, as I think is well known by many now, is that I am really a behind-the-scenes chappy. I'm not um, part of any of the band's business affairs, and it's wonderful that actually you... I've come in to help your longtime friend Joe uh, manage all those things. I am here as a creative mentor, and I will have to, whether I like it or not, um, stay on for a little while longer uh, with the band uh, playing on stage, just until Zach and Joe, who is now also determined to re uh, to to um, take up. Um, his keyboard player again, which actually he's very good at, so that he can do a bit of that. And then I don't think there will need to be a kind of direct replacement uh, for me. Um, I am a one-off, and probably because the world has changed so much, the, the, there are the people who have the skills um, that I have got probably are not um, suited to the kind of life that I have needed to live in order to do it. So I am probably gone, 
But my legacy will not be. There's all my music there, and there's much unpublished stuff as well that the band will be able to draw on. I am going to spend the remainder of my days in the audience cheering the band on and trying to help you uh, make the Enidi bigger, stronger and more powerful. Because the secret to our financial stability isn't about continually asking for handouts from our uh, wealthier individual fans, uh, but in fact to increase the size of the Enidi from the six or seven hundred it is at the moment to the levels that we had in the 1980s. I mean, with two and a half thousand members, uh, we can put on some fantastic uh, annual events. Uh, we can do a lot, and those subscriptions coming in will provide the stability that the band needs in order to go on forward without being hampered continually by having to find money to build stayed sets to do all the things that we uh, want to do. And um, that, I think, is going to be my challenge now that this Palmer thing is over. He is a very horrible man. The, um, I don't hate him because as soon as those kind of feelings come to me, I mean, there have been times when I felt like going around there, you know, with a sawn-off shotgun and blowing the place to bits, but that's just a fantasy. People have to sometimes do that, but only very occasionally. Um, largely, I feel deeply sorry for this tragic man who has wasted his life, really, uh, on the, the obsession with material uh, things. He's a trophy hunter, a collector, and he doesn't uh, has been able to have proper relationships with other human beings. And I think this is down to his childhood. I know very little about his childhood apart from the fact of the things he's told me, which are that he grew up uh, in somewhere in Wales, that his father had come out of the, first, of the Second World War, um, having been in the Marines. Um, I think Gerald was probably pretty savagely beaten by his father. I, I think Gerald and I probably have a lot in common in terms of what it was like for a, um, a young boy growing up in the immediate post-war things. He's a, he's, a, he's a deeply damaged person and it's led to this. And I suppose the corollary of that is that I also had a... Uh, I didn't have a father that beat me. My mother did all the beating. But um, nevertheless, it was a... Um, you know, we'd, we've both uh, the victims of, well, I said victims, not victims, survivors, I suppose is the new word, right, of very unhappy uh, and deeply troubled childhoods. It's a real tragedy for him. And, a, you know, and a, if you like, <laughs> an irony for me that I met this man that probably saved my life in the latter half of it by being such a cunt. Which he has been. I mean, the band do dislike him, uh, but uh, you know, it's. Um, they. I think Max actually hates him. I think Max has has had to bear the brunt of all this stuff, and the unfairness of the legal system. I mean, the the most recent situation was that we tried to get the court to agree that uh, Gerald Palmer ought to pay our costs, considering that he'd lost the case of the publishing. Um, but. You know, there were all kinds of legal technicalities. I wasn't there at court. Uh, and it ended up that in spite of the fact that he behaved unreasonably and the court said he had, uh, we still couldn't get any of our costs. And um, our barrister said, oh, well, this is unjust and we should consider an appeal and all of that. Do you really want this thing to go on and on and on? We could appeal, but probably lose that. Then we'd have to go up higher, you know, get to the Supreme Court. No. I mean, it's just an obsessional thing. We've got music to do. They've got the trilogy to come. I've got this album I want to do with uh, Jason, which we've been looking forward to doing together for a long time, once, uh, you know, now dust is out of the way. And then I've got my piano concerto to do, which I am absolutely determined uh, to finish before I die. Wealth creation is not just about creating money pots. 
uh, which is what we cu- what we currently think about wealth creation. That we immediately get this vision of, you know, these sort of sort of hedge fund people and and all the rest of it sitting on loads of money, which of course is true. They are doing it, and that's what's given capitalism such a bad name. Wealth creation is about when the very first Stone Age man picked up a flint and went and realized that he had created something valuable by doing that because he had a sharp cutting edge to do things that he couldn't do before. Wealth creation is about what we do with our lives and what we create with them. And that means that the music that we create, just looking at our purely at the, the, the little community of Enid and the tribe of Enidi beyond, um, helping us do that, creating this cultural wealth. You know, wealth is not just about money. And I once did say to Gerald, I wrote to him and I said, you know, Gerald, this is a very sad situation because at the end of all of this, um, you know, at the very best, you will come out of this, um, you know, with a Pyrrhic victory. Nothing that you could actually really say you've achieved anything. At the worst, it could destroy you. Well, I don't think it's done that yet. Though I do think his chances of... Um, of, uh, I mean, he's the same age as me. He, you know, neither of us have got long for this earth. Uh, we might have, you know, the, the, the remaining years in front of us are nothing compared to all the missed opportunities and the things that we could have done in our lives um, had we acted differently. And that goes for me as much as it does for him. But I think that he has dark days ahead because I don't think that he um, yet understands that the Shroud has no pockets, that he will not be able to control his family and his possessions from beyond the grave. And uh, that is something which he will have to confront, which I don't need to. And um, I do feel in that sense that... um, that I am, together with the other members of the band, the victor in this situation, in spite of uh, the financial cost, because it's only money. I mean, there are two ways you can look at money. There are people who look at money as a sort of, as, 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 as a possession. They have money in the bank and they think, I've got this money, this is mine, right? And then there are people like me who think that money is more like excrement, you know, that it's actually something that you need to get rid of and put it to work to do something like manuring the garden and making the seeds grow or what have you. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, money to me is just um, like the lubrication, if you like, of of, of the creative world. And that's why I'm not, I mean, I am on the left of politics, of course I am. You know, why why wouldn't I be, uh, you know, with views like that? But I'm not, um, I'm not somebody who hates the world because I don't like the way it is. Because I realise it's always been this way. You know, the, the world has changed enormously. Uh, when you look at the difference between the world we live in now and what life was like, for example, in this country, in the, um, you know, in the sort of first century after the Romans got here. But in fact, the moral behaviour of individuals hasn't changed a bit since then. We're exactly the same people as we were. And there are many good people then, and there are many wicked people. And it's exactly the same as it is now. What I do find um, very worrying is that uh, there is now um, a, a level of hatred in society, not against individuals, but against groups of people that um, collectively represent a threat to some other group. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we seem to, uh, I think social media, which I'm not very keen in, and not a very great participant in, I do it, but not, I'm not constantly on there, you know, showing pictures of the cat and what I ate for lunch, you know. I mean, I don't think they're, they're of either any interest. Or, uh, and, you know, this concept that everyone has a right to my opinion, they don't, you know, I mean, 
uh, I haven't got a right to impose my views on people and just sort of put it out there. I think social media has got an awful lot of growing up to do. Um, it's very new and there's so much dross on there at the moment that um, I think it will burn its course. So I think the young generation growing up now, the kids that I meet um, in still in their teens and just leaving school, uh, they have such a different take on life. Uh, to those, even those um, of Joe's age, actually, and um, and certainly in my generation, I've I've seen so many changes, and it, it is one of those things, you know, the concept that somehow the old, uh, those people who've actually lived and very often uh, achieved um, during a long life, have nothing to offer. That's so wrong. Uh, we've got a great deal to offer, uh, not all of us, but um, those who've paid attention and are still connected to the generations growing up, those that have got grandchildren, you know, all of that sort of thing. Um, I don't have grandchildren, but I've got a huge sort of <laughs> range of un-grandchilded uh, um, um, people, if you like. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I am plugged into youth. I think very much that um, that uh, I've always seen the generation that is being born, you know, as the future of the uh, human race, uh, uh, rather than you know us who are. This is one of the problems with climate change and those things. You know, no one who is sort of my age is going to is is really bothered about that this idea oh it's, we can't land our grandchildren and our children's children with all these problems it's crocodile tears uh, politicians going on about that they will do what they need to do and say to get elected and that is that is one of the problems with democracy which of course churchill said was the worst form of government except for all the others you know and i mean i think that you know there are enormous problems and we're living through them now. But it's up to the artists. I mean, when you look at uh, societies, uh, it doesn't matter right down through the ages, when you look at societies that are going through times of upheaval, whether it's a French Revolution, whether it's uh, during the, the, the decline of the Roman Empire, any of those things. Um, look at the more recent things, Stalin, Hitler, you know, the persecution of intellectuals, of artists, of creative people, of thinkers, of people who've got their heads screwed on, these were all rounded up and shut up. And we can see all that situation now going on in the Middle East, uh, where there is all these ructions, where the, um, sensible opinions are being suppressed and thoughtful opinions are being suppressed because they are a threat, because ideas ultimately can only really be vanquished by other ideas, not by armies. Uh, they have their place, but uh, military force can only be used as an adjunct to negotiation and, um, you know, settlement between ourselves. It never actually settles anything, simply going to war or bombing or whatever else is on the agenda at the moment. Well, an artist is, um, for me, um, art uh, in most of most of its forms um, is able to reveal often profound truths about the world without resorting to facts. Uh, art is able to get at um, at ideas in a poetic way, that so that even with no understanding really of science. Uh, art is able to give us some kind of, of vision of the grandeur and the immensity of the cosmos. We don't need, uh, you know, to sort of conceptualise uh, the sort of mathematics of it. Art, um, music in particular, is an emotional language which transcends all other languages. It goes directly to the heart and it has this ability to speak... Uh, many uh, often complementary but conflicting uh, 
emotions simultaneously, bittersweet, for example, there's so much that can be joyful and sad at the same time. You know, people feel this very often in bereavement, the losing of someone with whom they've been happy all their life. That's a mixture of joy and sadness, you know, and music has this ability to communicate directly. Art, I think, um, always has the ability to stir up uh, people's uh, pre uh, prejudices and and, uh, and sort of beliefs that they thought they had settled on. Art is not there. It's not like a religion that dictates, unless it's um, unless it's put to use, like a political poster or those sort of things. But artists generally um, throw up. I suppose the best of us. Um, we're a bit like a mirror, you know. We say look at yourselves this is what you you are actually all like you know this is my take on what I see and if you're a good perceptive artist who's able to um, not uh, edit your content but to show it all with all its conflicts all its paradoxes all of those things it helps stir up people's thinking and start to re-examine some of those very settled, very firm, embedded ideas that they've always taken for granted but never actually perhaps thought about. And so art is good at doing that. And, uh, you know, literature, particularly the novel, um, is a fantastic way of getting, you know, under the skin of um, the facts. Because facts change. You know, everyone thought the world was flat. That was a fact, right? It isn't, right? We now know that. You know, but truth is something very different um, because that, is, that, that remains constant. Well... Uh, my position with dust has been largely a responsive one. Um, I am not responsible for the raw content of any of the music from dust. That has all come from others, um, particularly Joe, uh, whose um, melodic ideas, and that's what they are, uh, I've been provided with as the building blocks, if you like, of the music that I have then helped them create together. And as a collaborator, a collaborator, I've always found that uh, a much more inspiring life than trying to do it all on my own, which I think was what so much of the problem was uh, during the 90s when I ha no longer had my beloved Steve uh, with me to be my other, he was a sort of complimentary character. He wasn't able to do any of the things I could do and I couldn't do any of the things he could do. And together uh, we made this very creative um, partnership uh, which had other aspects to it, which meant that, you know, it wasn't going to be forever. I don't really want to say more than that. Um, you know, I think... Um, very very fondly of Steve but I found it very very difficult to cope uh, creatively without him until Jason really and now of course Joe who is so much like me in character and personality as I was at that age apart from the fact that uh, he doesn't punch people which I used to do. I used to punch my way through life, you know, to get my own way. I was um, a, a horrendous bully and, uh, you know, sort of autocrat. Um, that sort of leadership is... Uh, it, uh, whether or not it was appropriate at the time, I mean, that would be sophistry for me to try and argue that actually, uh, you know, it was a good thing because it wasn't. Because I could have handled things so much better than I did um, and the fact that I won through in many of the things is no excuse for um, the way that I behaved when I was young. Joe doesn't do that but on the other hand he is as petulant, as fiery 
and um, you know as emotional as uh, I well I still am uh, and uh, we have a lot in common also he always sees the glass is half full um, which is what I do um, dear Max always sees it as half empty and I suppose that we need a bit of both of that you know we can't always be so over optimistic that we get hoisted of our own petard uh, you know we have to Max is a very good sort of restraining influence on some of our wilder um, sort of aspirations. No, I really want to see the band uh, do well. I want to see it do well on its own terms. There are plenty of people out there if the band wanted to employ them in the way that um, Bartley James Harvest employed me, if you like, to help them uh, with the music if a point comes where I won't be able to do it anymore and they haven't yet quite coped. But I think Jason and, uh, uh, well, all of them really, um, between them, they I think they have everything, more or less, um, you know, that I've been able to bring to it. And they've got the examples of how I've done it. And uh, all my um, output is in digital form so that um, and when I say digital form I just don't mean recorded digitally I mean the actual pianola type uh, the MIDI in other words of much of the music that I've created in the past is still there and can be played around and manipulated and uh, altered and, re and used again um, as much as they want you know so it's not like um, when I'm gone, uh, that um, they won't be able to sort of still um, plunder my soul. <laughs> Grave robbing. <laughs> I'm going to be buried, and I want to be buried um, in a very, very sort of uh, non-religious context. That doesn't mean to say that I don't have great leanings towards religion. In fact, I once considered um, ordination, so I've come rather a long way. No, my fight with God has always been a continuous one where I've spent an awful lot of my time denying the, 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 the existence of a God and a lot of time talking to God about the problem I'm having with him. I want to be buried next to Stefan, Max's closest friend who died recently, because I went to that funeral, it was very moving. It was a humanist uh, ceremony and it was in uh, a burial ground, uh, you know, which is a place with lots of trees and, and other people and it's going to be there. So I think I'd just like to sort of go back to the dust from which I came, because ultimately dust is exactly about that and how valuable dust is. We're all stardust. I mean, most people don't realise that without the death of the first stars, uh, we couldn't have had the, all the elements that are required um, in the periodic table which are necessary for life to emerge. Um, is there some grand design? Was there some kind of wonderful watchmaker who stood outside uh, eternity, well, outside time in eternity and went and it all sort of flowed from that point? Um, was the implication, I mean, was Beethoven designed, you know, in the Big Bang? Well, who knows? I don't. And I don't think anybody does, really. And maybe I'm somebody who has spent a lot of time um, asking a lot of unanswerable and futile questions about our existence. And that would be a way of saying, well, That's like saying that life is pointless, that it's all futile. What's the point in living? What's the point in breathing? You know, I mean, no. I think we are destined to ask these questions, to adventure 
um, both in time and space, both in inner and outer space. I'm someone who tends to be more introverted in that I make models of reality. I think I, through looking inwards rather than more at the extrovert way of looking out at the world and believing what I see with my eyes, uh, I tend to come to believe more about what I think, right? And it's just two different sort of hands of the same creative thing. I actually do a bit of both. <laughs>